good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm John. This is many a true nerd, and welcome back to the many a true nerd top 50 games of all time. And uh, tonight we're going to be covering the next 12 games, uh, taking us uh, to the halfway point in the list. And tonight I've got some really big games, uh, some really small ones too, uh, and one that's literally never been on the channel. So. Uh, Okay, let's dive on in, shall we? Kicking off with number 37, Red Dead Redemption from 2010. And I adore the original Red Dead Redemption. And I think it's not right to begin anywhere other than how it looks. Because this game is stunning. The landscapes are just staggeringly pretty. And that's a really important thing, given how much of the game is spent riding through them. Like, to my mind... It's the colour and the lighting that do it. I could happily just chill out in this game and watch a train roll past for many a happy minute. And uh, in fact, I very often did uh, when I was playing this. Just, you know, uh, taking the odd bit of time out to uh, play some cards or do some other side activity. Just because uh, the game was so pretty, it was just nice to hang out in it. But... When you do get back to the core of the gameplay, mainly doing a very large amount of shooting, that feels great too. The Deadeye system especially looks stylish and feels great. But the real star of the show is the story, and it has to be, because as I say, you spend a lot of time riding through the wilderness talking to someone who's riding with you. Maybe about the mission you're heading to, but often about, you know, the world in general. Or something personal about that character. And the game has a great selection of secondary characters you spend time with before moving on, as John Marston always does. Though, perhaps my favourite bit of the entire game is the tone. Like, there's plenty of excitement and humour in the game, but there's also an underlying sadness to it. Like, you know from the start that the Old West is over. Your main objective is literally to help tidy some of it away. And that's why I do actually have a particular fondness for the game's low-stakes final missions. Engaging in some farming and hunting with your son is just really lovely to have a few moments of domestic peace before the inevitable conclusion rolls in. And it also doesn't hurt that there's a very silly DLC campaign as a nice little palate cleanser too. Number 36, a short hike from 2019. And uh, okay, a short hike is just a lovely gem of a game that's very, very short indeed, as you might guess from the name. But it surprised and delighted me every step of the way. Like, it starts off as a really simple exploration game. You wander around a cute island, playing games with the locals, helping a frog find a spade, chatting with an artist. It's all super sweet. But then the focus shifts a bit, and you're challenged to climb a mountain at the centre of the island. A tricky but manageable little challenge. Before finally getting to the top, where it turns out the only reason you wanted to get there at all was because it was the only spot on the island with mobile phone reception and you wanted to call up your mother and have a really sweet conversation with her, and uh, it's just lovely. It's just a really cocking lovely game that's just really stuck in my memory, damn it. Number 35, F0X from 1998, and uh, okay. F0X is, uh, to my mind, uh, the best racing game ever made, and one of the most pure as well, because uh, it's incredibly easy to pick up and have fun with. But the skill ceiling is incredibly high, in part due to the beautifully sensitive physics of the cars. When it comes to controlling the air, using the air brakes around corners, and the absolutely ludicrous speed that the game runs. And uh, I think what makes F-Zero-X great is that Nintendo knew precisely what they wanted the game to be and built it for that exact purpose. Say, the N64 original runs beautifully at 60 FPS, even in the middle of a chaotic 30 car Grand Prix. Though, hilariously, the Switch port actually runs worse because Nintendo are somehow incredibly bad at emulating their own games. Deeply baffling. But that there, that's why the game looks the way it does. Because every single background detail was tossed out of the game to ensure it ran fast and smooth. To create a game that's simultaneously a great skill-based time trial experience and also a chaotic 30-car Grand Prix scrum that viciously encouraged you to assassinate your rivals by slamming them into the nearest wall. The soundtrack's amazing, the original Big Blue theme of course will always be a favourite, and to my mind it has a better selection of tracks than its sequel, GX, including some absolutely vicious monsters like Big Hand. And as a final cherry on top, it has the X-Cup. 
a Grand Prix that generates six brand new tracks for you at random every single time you play. Just a fantastic racing game from start to finish. Number 34, Medieval 2 Total War and... Oh, this is just a wonderful game. Maybe not quite, you know, my favourite Total War, we'll get to that later, but I still hold that some of the ideas that Medieval 2 had have never been beaten elsewhere in the Total War franchise. For example, at its core, you've got yourself the city and castle system, where any settlement can either be a city, generating money but much more difficult to defend, or a castle which produced the best troops and could also be upgraded to a citadel with multiple layers of wall defence, forcing you to balance the need to produce troops at speed while simultaneously making enough money to pay for all these advanced expensive troops. It was a great system that, to my mind, was miles ahead of the current day Total War Siege system, as the Warhammer trilogy continues to this day to flail about trying to figure out how to make its sieges work. And it's also beautifully integrated into the wider campaign of Medieval 2. Like, the incoming hordes made castles extremely desirable to resist a huge amount of cavalry. While on the other hand, as technology advanced and gunpowder and cannons started entering the game, you might instead consider retiring some of your castles as cities could produce all the gunpowder troops you'd ever need. Meaning, the game kind of nudges the player into following real historical shifts in warfare, where the rising dominance of gunpowder and cannons made older castles and other traditional medieval troops much less effective. But putting all of that aside, Medieval 2 is an extremely solid entry into the franchise that's aged really well. And there's just so much stuff in here. The crusade mechanic is really fun and great at throwing the odd curveball at a campaign, and cavalry is maybe the best it's ever been in the franchise. Hugely powerful, but easy to take out if you surround it and then drag it down. And the last minute bonus appearance of America on the map is a nice touch too. Though, honestly, it shows up so late that conquering it is really more of a victory lap than anything else. But overall, it's a great game, though yes indeed, there might well be more Total War games yet to come further up this list. Number 33, Dishonored from 2012, and uh, okay, this one was tricky for me, especially when Dishonored 2 has some absolute cocking showstopper missions, but in the end, uh, for me, I preferred the more open and Dishonored one, where the game just gives you an open adventure playground, uh, a target to assassinate, and you had to figure out the rest for yourself. And there's not much I enjoy more than being given a pile of toys and superpowers uh, and then let loose on the world, and... Uh, Blimey are the toys in Dishonored 1 great. That's the joy of Dishonored for me. It's a game that provides a great experience no matter how you play it. As a stealth gamer, you've got the tools to sneak along rooftops, scout out enemy vision cones, slip in the back door, and neutralize your enemies without even bloody killing them. It feels great, but the combat most definitely doesn't feel like a punishment for failing at stealth either. Tossing enemies into hazards, throwing bombs around, even freezing time, and then grabbing your enemies' projectiles out of mid-air. It's all fantastic, and... Even the Chaos System, which is Dishonored's kind of take on a morality system, I suppose, adds something really cool to the game, as rather than just changing the story, it literally changes the levels to have more enemies in them. More rats, more weepers, maybe opening up some interesting opportunities, as well as providing a wildly different experience in the final mission, which adds a lot of replayability to my mind. Just overall, it's a classic that feels so badass to play. Number 32, Crusader Kings 3 from 2020, and uh, okay, this was another tricky one because uh, I love uh, Crusader Kings 2. In fact, I've played more Crusader Kings 2 than I have of Crusader Kings 3, but I think Crusader Kings 3 just about edges it out for me, with the biggest difference being I adore how Crusader Kings 3's journeys uh, do a lot to create a sense of physical space. Like, you know, your character travelling through the world uh, when they're on pilgrimage and whatnot. Though, much of what I'm about to say could be applied to Crusader Kings 2 as well. Basically, I love this game because it embraces silliness. Like, at a glance, Crusader Kings probably looks like a game about building up troops, then invading your neighbour and slowly painting the map, but what puts this game above uh, so many others uh, is that really, that's kind of secondary. The actual focus is 100% on characters, on that one individual you're playing as, and his desire to, you know, say, win that archery contest, and raises some properly to ensure he gets a good education. At the end of the day, it's all about role-playing as a character, 
and going on a journey that, if you're lucky, might grow your kingdom, or alternatively, might instead lead to you being, you know, the greatest chess player of the 12th century. It's just a marvellous time. And okay, is Crusader Kings 3 perfect? Absolutely not. But does it make me smile and laugh every time I play it? Absolutely. Number 31, Donkey Kong Country from 1994. And, okay, to my mind, Donkey Kong Country is comfortably my favourite 2D platformer of all time. And it is an absolute cocky technical marvel. Like, this game is now 30 years old, and it still looks good. Like, there is a reason that in the intervening 30 years between then and now, Donkey Kong's design basically has never been changed. There are very few games in this world so gorgeous that the look of that franchise is crystallised in that style for decades to come. But putting aside the graphics, it's a great platformer in its own right, full of brilliant ideas that keep at every level feeling unique. The odd minecart rider, levels where you're being chased, multiple animal partners to change up the rules of movement and combat, and an incredible soundtrack too. Like, even the level select music is iconic in Donkey Kong Country. Though, to my mind, it's the haunting underwater music that really sticks with me. An absolutely timeless classic. Number 30, Dragon Age Origins from 2009. And, okay. So Dragon Age Origins is, you know, another game that I came to pretty recently. But I fell in love with it immediately. And uh, what I think stands out to me more than anything else is the incredible amount of thought that went into world building. And uh, honestly, that shouldn't really be a surprise. Like the already mentioned Knights of the Old Republic, this was made by Bioware during their Golden Age. But whatever, they deserve to be praised multiple times for it. It's just wonderful to see how deep and interesting the land of Ferelden and Thedas are. And it's so easy to get sucked into the plot. Like, I wasn't even playing as a mage, but by the end of Origins, I still had some very strong views about how the Templars are complete dicks, and how the various mage factions that wanted independence from the Gentry were onto a good idea. You're just constantly learning about the world, and in a lesser game, it would probably be overwhelming. But Dragon Age is beautifully written, and I came to really care about it. And it doesn't hurt, of course, that the game has some beautifully realised companions who are brilliantly scripted and voice acted. Alistair and Morrigan in particular are among my favourite Bioware companions of all cocking time, and their bickering was absolutely delightful too. The morality is also pleasingly murky, in part because Dragon Age Origins doesn't so explicitly tie choices to a morality meter, but instead a reputation system, which creates way more difficult dilemmas like, do I do the thing I want to do, or do I do the thing that will make Alistair want to sleep with me? Seriously, that's actually a very tricky one. I love Alistair. Alistair's great. Also, I kind of been noticed I've barely actually mentioned the gameplay yet. Combat is certainly a bit on the complex side, especially magic, but again, it never felt too overwhelming to me. And everyone feels uh, pleasingly mighty in their own way, whether it's a tank that just cocking refuses to die, or a mage dropping a magical nuke on a crowd of enemies. Though, arguably, the number of abilities gets a little bit ridiculously high by the end of the game. Maybe that's the one thing stopping this game rising a higher in the list, but... Even so, it's an absolute cocky classic. Number 29, Batman Arkham Asylum from 2009. And, uh, okay, Arkham Asylum is a game that lets me continue my trend of looking at a franchise when 99% of people agree that the second or third game is the best one, and instead declaring, no, it was the first one that got it right. I've done that several times already, and there's plenty more to cocking come yet. But I just love Arkham Asylum. As great as it absolutely was in Arkham City to be able to, you know, travel through Gotham, dropping from the rooftops and whatnot, I always come back to Arkham Asylum instead. And to my mind, yeah, the crucial bit is this. Because the game takes place in a much more confined space, it always felt like the most Titan-focused Arkham game to me, moving you straight from one great set piece to the next. And because it was more linear, it could keep things more varied. A cool stealth section where you could pick off the enemies silently, an open fight, a traversal puzzle, even the bosses had their own unique rules and gimmicks, like the stealth platforming of the Scarecrow sections, for example. On top of that, there was just so much right with this game. Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill are, of course, providing the definitive voices for Batman and Joker, and the combat's got a beautiful smooth flow to it. Just an incredible game from start to finish. Number 28, Eternal Darkness from 2002, and uh, okay. 
Eternal Darkness is probably my favourite horror game of all time, and uh, I think what makes it special is uh, the scale of it. You see, you played as Alexandra Roivas, who's exploring her deceased grandfather's house as the game's framing device. Every time she finds a hidden page from an ancient cursed book, you play through the story as she reads it, meaning the game's got 12 chapters spanning 2,000 years of history. The earliest being the story of a Roman centurion in the Parthian Empire, the latest being in the modern day. Now, that's really fun in itself, because every character is bringing very different abilities, like a photographer who can use the flash of his camera to disorientate enemies. But the real genius is how the stories and locations interacted. You see, there's only actually four locations in the story, meaning you go back to them with different characters, which works incredibly well because the locations change a lot between visits. The first time you go to France say you're visiting a small abbey in the 9th century, but the next time you visit it's the 15th century and the abbey has been hugely expanded into a giant cathedral and this time you're a priest who's under suspicion of committing a murder in the middle of a panic about witchcraft. And then you revisit again in the middle of World War One. and on top of that characters you've previously played as might actually you know reappear as ghosts or whatnot. Items you hid away 500 years ago could be retrieved, spells you learned a millennia back can be improved upon, it's just a brilliant way to structure a game and uh, I've not even touched on the game's most famous feature yet, the sanity meter, which if you face, you know, too many monsters or just messed up stuff in general, would cause your character in the game itself to become an unreliable narrator. Starting with a small face you might not even notice, a statue turning to face you or a portrait bleeding say, though... Yes, as time went on, the game would start openly messing with you, pretending your save data was corrupted, or the controller was disconnected, a fake crash screen, even a to-be-continued message of pretending the game was over and would be continued in a sequel that didn't exist. It was just a wonderful, marvellous way of doing sanity effects, and uh, just in general, Eternal Darkness, a fantastic, brilliant game. Number 27, Portal from 2007, and uh, okay, this is the perfect example of a game picking a one core mechanic to build a game around, uh, thereby giving that game an incredibly tight focus, and uh, that's the genius of this game. You can understand everything you need to know in a matter of seconds. You have a gun, use it to create a hole in reality that links one spot to another. That's it, use that to complete the game. And if that had been it, like you know, just a really smart physics puzzle game, it probably still would have been regarded as a great game, but it's the woven in narrative that elevates it to one of my top games of all time. The brilliantly written and voice acted instructions and sarcasm from GLaDOS. Funny, absolutely, but also with a growing sense of menace as the game proceeds. You know something isn't quite right here, keeping the player constantly pulled forward by both the compelling puzzle design and the desire to learn what precisely GLaDOS has got in store for you. It's a game that's pretty short, but that's good. Too many games are longer than they need to be. What this game's got is some great puzzles and a brilliant narrative, which it shared with you in about five hours, at which point it was done, and then it sang you a really bloody nice song. A brilliant game, very literally, from start to finish. Number 26, a Star Wars Jedi Knight 2, a Jedi Outcast from 2002, and, uh, okay, so. The Star Wars franchise has got a fair few shooters in it, and uh, plenty of lightsaber combat games too, but... It's not that common to find a game that embraces both as equals, and that's why I adore Jedi Outcast. Though, I should stress, this spot could probably just as easily have gone to Jedi Academy. It's just Outcast is the one I played first and had the fondest memories of. But yes, the point is, what makes this game special to me is, it feels like two games in one, both really solid Star Wars games, where you can just switch between them as the situation demands. Like, as a first person shooter, it's great. The arsenal you've got access to is a varied and powerful, and all the guns have got really fun secondary functions, like bullets that bounce off walls and stuff. But then, all of a sudden, a short way into the story, you get your hands on a lightsaber and some force powers, and uh, that's hilarious too. A lightsaber swing will destroy plenty of enemies in the game with a single tap. And force powers that knocked enemies flying were extra hilarious given the environments in this game were very heavy on walkways and long drops. But, and this is crucial, you never felt for one moment that the lightsaber was this game's final ultimate mega weapon that rendered the guns obsolete. 
Now, you could absolutely rely on it pretty much exclusively if you wanted to, but you could also ignore it and keep playing the game as a first-person shooter. Or maybe just, you know, mix and match a bit. And crucially, this game asks a very important question. Which is, given Jedi deflect blaster shots by moving their lightsaber in the way of a shot, wouldn't, in theory, a shotgun blast be to Jedi? Because they couldn't block all the shots simultaneously. And this game replies, yes, you know what? That makes sense. And as a result, the shotgun was a ludicrous Jedi mincing machine. And when the Dark Jedi showed up and pulled out lightsabers, shooting them with a shotgun was genuinely a really good tactic. And it's the best thing ever. 10 out of 10, add more shotguns into Star Wars, damn it. And there we go. That brings me to the halfway point in our top 50. So uh, let's wrap things up there because... Uh, Yes, indeed. We have got some very, very big games yet to cover. And even now, there's another game that's never been on the channel that's waiting to make its appearance. What's it going to be? Join me next time, and we shall flipping see. But in the meantime, I've been John. This has been many a true nerd. And this has been my top games of all time. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Wait, wait, and flamethrower! 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 Okay, so this is... This is definitely morally questionable. The point where you start singing the flamethrower song, potentially, you've gone over the line.